the Driftless Region. This is a unique corner of the world that shaped my life for the better part of two years. But oftentimes, when I'm talking shop with other fishy folk out there, my nostalgic retellings of these experiences are met with confused looks, followed by Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin? They have trout all the way up there? I usually just chuckle and shake my head because not only do they have thousands of miles of wild trout streams, but the Driftless region boasts a unique landscape, rich culture, and most importantly, genuinely good people. It's hard to explain, but it really does feel like you're turning back the clock to a simpler time. I've been anxiously awaiting my return to endless summer days and rising trout and I have a few solid weeks to cram in as much as possible to bottle up this feeling. But with how much goes on each week, encapsulating this adventure, it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to try my best, so let's get right into it. Upon my long-awaited return to the Midwest, one humid and deep breath is required. For almost a year now, I've been living in the deserts and arid mountains of the Southwest, and that subtle squeeze of humidity never felt so comforting as I made my way north. The road from St. Louis, it's not long, but it's tedious enough to make your mind wander. Reaching back into the filing cabinet that is my brain, I really have to dust off those old files, because I spent the better part of two years living in Madison, Wisconsin, and fishing all throughout the Driftless region itself. I had a front row seat to the seasons changing while the sun did a few spins. And using Instagram as my receipt, I know I caught a lot of fish, but when I think back, they all kind of blend together into one blissful hook set. But what does really stick out for this time in my life are the people that I met. I was lucky enough to cross paths with some really awesome people that I would now consider close friends. And so. As I pull into the drive, some of you OGs out there may recognize this Sasquatch. This is Blake. I'm here with a familiar face, Blake. If you we've seen we've seen him a couple times. Blake here. was once a random DM on Instagram a few years back, but now I would consider him one of my better friends. We had some pretty incredible adventures across the seasons, chasing all sorts of trout all throughout Iowa. But like myself, Blake is a Missouri transplant, doing his best to get out and crush any and all outdoor opportunities. A local conservation job brought him all the way up to Iowa, but the turkey, trout, and deer, they just might keep him here. Getting to spend any time in the Driftless region during the summer is nothing short of a dream for a trout junkie like myself. So when Blake offered to let me stay with him for an entire month, I couldn't pass up that opportunity. Passing the sleepy ag fields and dairy farms of the upper Midwest, we sped over the countryside and left Decorah and her bald eagles behind us. Our sights were set on the outskirts of the Driftless region in hopes of finding a particular cold water creek tucked away in the hills. We left fairly early, but it would seem as though we were not the only ones with that idea. Before the sun touched down, we had already resorted to plan B, but this wasn't a big deal. I knew we weren't gonna run into many other people on this next spot. All right, Blake, we are here. First Driftless trip. Gang, gang. Let's go, dude. As we laced up the boots and rigged up the rods, I could feel the subtle humidity of a Driftless morning wrapping me in a lovely little hug. It has been over a year since I've been back to this magical part of the world, and the familiar sights and sounds gave me a real sense of satisfaction. So. A deep breath, and a few bootlaces later, I could hardly contain my excitement because it was finally time to hit the water. Now, most access points in the Driftless region will drop you right on top of good fishing with minimal walking required, and there's nothing wrong with that. A little different than the West for sure, but this plan B is a little different than most spots here in Iowa. I would consider this hike rather long for the area and very much outside the box thinking, but don't be fooled. The wildflowers and chimney rock make the juice well worth the squeeze before you even make your first cast. So as that sun kept crawling up over the horizon, we left the field and entered the forest. And like I said, getting to the stream is a little different compared to most stream access here. You want me to hold it until you get out there some more? I got it. Make sure I'm just worried that 
on all these rivers, you go five feet and it drops. Well, so I'll, be I'll careful that you don't run into the channel. Know what I mean? I'll scramble back up. I'll, I meant your camera being worth money and not getting wet. Oh, we've far surpassed that. A lot of these things, like you'll go, 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 and it's drop. Hoisting our gear up and over the head, we started our morning with a belly button deep shuffle across the Upper Iowa River, and. On top of it being rather cold in certain spots, I can't say I would recommend doing this any higher and this might have been a bit too dangerous. River channels can shift, sandy bottoms can give way, and strong currents can pull you under. Water is very strong, folks. This spot, it might be safer to access during low water seasons like fall or winter, but we made it across no worse for wear and found the mouth of the creek that we were looking for. Blake and I were fairly confident that no one else would be following in our footsteps today, and relieved we finally had the creek to ourselves, we meandered through the river bottom and dispersed trees until our target stream cleared up and started looking really fishy. Yes. Let's go. First trip was fish of the trip. <laughs> awesome, dude. Hell yeah. Thanks, buddy. See ya. The structure on this lower portion is perfect for trout. This creek, much like others, snakes back and forth creating the ideal riffle run pool configuration. So it didn't take Blake long to find his first fish of the day. And this spunky holdover rainbow was a ticket we both needed to break the skunk. Now, the rest of the day would be pure gravy. Oh, nope. Here you go. Cause I said you're asking a lot of me left hand. There we go, first trout of the day. There yes, we go. Sir. To all my driftless anglers out there watching, you know it and you love it. But to anyone unfamiliar with this area, the creek beds here, they tend to be rather silty. When you approach a potential run, be very aware of the back eddies created by the current and be cognizant of how much mud you're kicking up. You can see the impact of my boot shuffles, even though I didn't do all that much walking as I tried to move myself into casting position. Clouding up the water will spook the fish and make all your pretty double hauls irrelevant. But luckily for me, the dust settled just fine and I was able to pull out quite a few fish from this productive run. And truth be told, I probably should have done a better job fishing this because this is the type of run that could easily hold 10 to 20 fish, no question. But after landing two rainbows and a wild brown, I should not even begin to complain about underperforming. So while the deer spooked across the open field, we switched up flies and made our way further upstream. And while I was taking a pit stop to relieve myself from too much morning coffee, Blake found himself a beautiful wild brown in the back of this run. All right, if you just wanna lay him down in the water there. Sweet dude. Ooh. Keep hammering this run. Yeah. Hey, there it is. Give him the sauce, baby. Give him the sauce. That's a nicer brown. Ah! <laughs> Looper reel. Between the legs, baby. Hell yeah, that's the nicest brown of the day for sure. There you go. Let's see him back. Ooh, some attitude. <laughs> Very nice, man. Way to go. Okay. That brown you caught was really nice, bro. Is that a fish? Uh, you know, I don't know. I treated it like one, and I was not rewarded. I could have been hitting bottom. Set that hook. Okay. That was some weird freaking bleep timing. <laughs> lots of stalkers, lots of holdovers, but we'll take them nonetheless. Oh. Lots of stalkers and lots of holdovers is right. 
Northeast Iowa has untold numbers of cold water streams that are absolutely loaded with trout. Some of these streams are managed as wild fisheries. Others see a mix of wild and stocked. And some, they're just purely stocked. This particular stream we're fishing has a fair mix of wild browns, stocked rainbows, and the rare, but very much real, wild rainbow trout, which I'll get into later in the video. But what happens in most of these streams is that the stocked fish will be dumped in throughout the year to meet angling demand, and most of the time, if they aren't caught within the first week, these fish will disperse to different parts of the system and what I call hold over. You can really tell the difference between the fish that have been in the system for a long time and those that got thrown in last month. Blake refers to the cement stockers as quote unquote squishy because they've not yet developed the muscle needed to fight the current all day. Regardless of how you feel about the hatchery systems, they give anglers of all experience levels the chance to chase trout throughout this corner of Iowa. And by no means am I saying that Blake and I don't appreciate the tug of these raceway heroes because they're great. But it's undeniable that wild fish fight like hell and tend to be much more beautiful. So we kept pushing further upstream in the hopes of finding some wild fish. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Ooh, yeah. Great shot, man. All right, I'm ready whenever you are. Yeah, that's a deadly drift right there, too. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. That's a good fish. That's a better fish. Does that still count as call my own shot? If I did, uh, okay. I'll count it. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, dude, great fish. That's what we're looking for right there, it's buddy. Even big water, but sure enough. Oh, dude, he's gorgeous. Holy cow. That's driftless right there, man. Oh, that's what that lane is. See ya. Best fish of the day, easily. Execution. Let's freaking go. That's <laughs> the name of the game is execution. Blake managed to dredge up another great pocket water brown, and as it flopped away, it seemed like we were really building up some fishy momentum. The sun was now high in the sky, and our chilly morning had been replaced by a warm breeze. Now, I spoke on this earlier, but this next hole is exactly what I had in mind. With how healthy the streams in this area are, you can find nice spots like this that can hold untold numbers of fish. Realistically, with the log jam, the deep pool, and the swift current at the top, you could find two or three times the amount of fish that I did. And not only is there quantity here, but the potential for quality is also very high. <laughs> that might have been it. There it is. Oh, 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 Yes, dude, that's a fish right there. That's a driftless buttery boy. Let's go. <laughs> is he coming up okay? Yeah. It's all right in the sun. Dang, man. That's nice. If Mr. Man will oblige. Ah, it's driftless for you, baby. That's what I like to see. Whew. So even after we got on that really nice fish and a handful of others before, we managed to hook three and land two more fish out of this same hole. I hope this is starting to make sense. So. Even if fishing is tough in the driftless region, one good hole like this can completely turn around your day. Or, in our case, add yet another cherry on top of an already amazing day. But with the sense of greed and gluttony pulling at my heartstrings, I could not keep a clean conscience harassing this super productive run anymore. So instead, we kept pushing upstream and ran into a rather weird situation while Blake was stripping in a trash panda. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Might be a bass. Oh, it's a, ba oh, it's a bass, too. It was a, a smallie? It's a large amount, I think. No kidding. There's a 15 incher. Wow. One trout, though. Holy cow. That surprised wow. the heck out of me. 
unsure of whether or not this was a big old largemouth bass or a brown with a donkey head, we left this run a bit perplexed, but further upstream, Blake dredged up another nice rainbow while I scooped and scored with a beautiful little brown. So even though we were clearly finding fish with the flies we were using, it's always good practice to flip some rocks and see what's on the menu. And this particular drift of stream was very healthy and each rock flip turned up a wide range of bug life. Big mayflies, scuds, sow bugs, and caddis all seem to be present in this system on top of sculpin, chub, and other tasty critters in and around the creek. And I apologize in advance, but the learning lessons are going to continue because at this very next run, I managed to find the first wild rainbow of the day. I'm gonna stop for a second and talk about this one. I apologize for the rambles, but especially for you driftless folks, this is a really kind of a cool fish. So this right here, looks like your everyday average rainbow, but that is almost, I mean, without a doubt, a wild rainbow. Its fins are really intact. I mean, it looks good. Now, what makes it so important or kind of special is that there's not a lot of streams in the area that produce wild rainbow trout for whatever reason. I'm sure it has to do with like temperature and seasonality. But yeah, this is one of the only streams in the entire Drifters region that can, yeah, sustain a wild bow population. And yeah, that is one dandy right there, so. Yeah, are you seeing back? See ya, Budski, thank you. Very cool. We're finding them today, man. We're finding them for sure. It may not seem like much to anyone out there that's used to fishing for wild bows, but for the Driftless region, these little gems are very special. But as the day kept pressing on hard, Blake and I kept this rinse and repeat model going. And at this point, I would say that we were very much dialed in hard and the fish, their activity never really slowed down. So we kept hiking, kept bothering toads, and we kept finding some more beautiful wild browns. And with how far up in the system we'd worked, this was set to be our last hole in the day. Yeah, he's been caught before, look at him. He's got a crooked smile. You know it's been one of those days when you don't care to net a 12 inch rain, a 12 inch brown. Yeah, you know, we're doing well. <laughs> Let's go. All righty, Blake and I have started the hike back downstream. While he's changing up his streamer rig, I'm gonna talk about our main rig. This is the, I would say the setup that's caught 99.99% of the fish today. Had a couple eats on the dry dropper rig and a couple in the streamer, but we'll talk about maybe those later if they start picking up. But this is the juice. and. Like always, I'm rocking the nine foot five weight, the ant fire, it's cash money. It's really good at holding kind of these kind of setups. And this is a double nymph setup. So on the bottom is a heavy tungsten, whatever, mayfly, scud, just something big and buggy. There is so much bug life in these driftless streams and that is what they've been keying in on. And on our middle fly, you know, it hasn't really mattered all that much. It's more just, I guess, for presentation, maybe to get a little bit of attention, kind of a bigger bug here. Like I've got a patch rubber leg on right now. I had a stone fly on earlier, but majority of our, our bites have come on this bottom fly. And that is all under our New Zealand strike indicator. I really like the New Zealand strike indicator because they're really easy to adjust and they are great at really keying in on those subtle bites. It lands soft and when, when a fish does actually bite, it goes under. So that is the setup. That's what we've been using and it's been just crushing today. Today's been really good. So Blake and I are gonna keep hiking on downstream, maybe get on a few with the streamer and yeah, wrap this day up. So stick with and stay tuned. Oh, 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 that's a fish. Return of the TP, that's a good fish too. Yeah, dude, streamer fish, let's go. Oh, chubby chub. There he is. He's eating a bunch of chub. All right, whenever you're ready, sir. Hell yeah, dude. Say ya. Back. Boom. <laughs> he says, I'm back, baby. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Unfortunately, that streamer muncher, it was just a one-off because all the other holes, they did not produce much. So 
Blake and I both agreed it was high time to hightail it and get out of Dodge. And for the first trip back, I could not be more satisfied with the results of this outing. After spending almost two years of my life in this corner of the world, I hold the entire Driftless region very close to my heart. The fishing, it's nothing short of phenomenal, and the scenery is soothing to the soul. Since being back, something I can't stop thinking about is the sound. Coming from the desert and the southern Rockies, there's a certain absence of sound. So the contrast of the cacophony of sound in the upper Midwest is absolutely intoxicating. The songbirds whistle their tune from dawn till dusk, while the gentle breeze rustles the endless green. Life is buzzing, everything is alive. Hard to believe I was lucky enough to make it back and I can't wait to see what the rest of June has in store. But snapping back into reality, this wasn't a vacation. No, 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 there was still a lot of work to be done. I still have a day job, contrary to popular belief, so most of my days in between fishing are consumed with crunching out work projects and working on fishy edits with any additional spare time that I do have. And as long as the farmer isn't out cutting the fields or grabbing hay for the herds, Kelsey and I will go on occasional walks around the property to stretch out our legs and get some much needed sunshine. But Usually, that's not enough for me, so trail runs in the evenings are oftentimes required to really scratch that itch. And one of the nights this week, I had to leave the farm to run a quick errand and told Blake I would try and track him down later. And after making a quick stop into one of my favorite breweries, you would never believe who I ran into. Get in. Hell yeah, dude. The first of hopefully many weeknights summer trips is now officially underway, and I could not be more excited. Being more central with regards to the Iowa Driftless region, Blake's farm is just a few miles away from some of the lesser known streams that I was never able to hit when I lived here. Expectations were low and spirits were high. All we needed was a fish or two to make this short drive more than worth it. So. Once we touched down, we walked upstream a bit to avoid any pressure put on by the fair weather bridge anglers, and the evening sun was still warm and the colors of the local wildflowers were absolutely stunning. Our little walk didn't take long, but we sure did pay the price once we got off the trail. Yeah, I'm getting smacked by sting nettle right now. Seen uglier. <laughs> Definitely seen uglier. That's not a bad fish. Well, now, where do you think you're going, sir? Oh, he's gone. That's where he thinks he's going. I mean, I'm sure there's a onesie twosie in there, maybe. Flopper. Oh, he gone forever. All right, here on, bye. See you. Well, nice. No more skunk. That's all you can ask for on a weeknight. Yeah. That's a nice fish, man. Let's freaking go, man. That's a great way to kind of clean up some of that trash we've been throwing. <laughs> well, we got this guy off camp, but he was sitting right where his buddy was, too. Not a bad little brownie brown. We'll, uh, Ooh, come on. All right, he's off. I'm back. Just like that. You want this one? No, go for it.
Oh, on the drive line. Oh, dude, that was so sick. Yeah, I'm gonna get a close up of that, that bug in his mouth. My goodness gracious. Great fish, man. That's crazy. <laughs> First hopper eater, let's, let's go. go. Buddy. <laughs> Alrighty, two quick things. First and foremost, that hopper bite was absolutely electric. I mean, are you kidding me? Hoppers already. That was so awesome. But the second thing, and I do apologize if you've heard this song and dance before and are very tired of my rambles. Hey, I am too. I'm right there with you. But that was caught on the adjustable dry dropper. This is a rig I came up with where you can adjust your dry dropper for depth and still be able to fish a dry just like that. Hook it, set it, bring it all the way home. And like always, folks, I've got the video linked down below showing you how to tie it, how to rig it, the whole nine. Just go there, watch that. Stop listening to me, blah, blah, on. But yeah, I think we got to ride this evening bite and hopefully get on some more dry fly action. That was, that was so sick. So let's jump back in there. Ironically, that, that's the opposite of my dry fly rig on this creek usually. Yeah? Only it's like a size like... Just a little boy? 12 atoms by like a 20 nat behind it. These fish can fight. What an absolute treat. Just to spend a random Tuesday night out on the water. Wallow come down. Well, yeah, they're, they're chasing all those buggies. All the bug. bug boys, see you. I'm having trouble seeing with my sunnies on. The shadows coming across the trees were now starting to get long, and Blake insisted that I keep fishing. And as dumb luck would have it, I must have hit the bite window on this stretch just about perfect. The bottom of the run, it wasn't as productive, but getting two quick fish was a good sign. This boy be in his bag. Come on back. Nice brown. That's a nice fish, man. They're putting good fish in here. Had to get it in there. Well, he's gone, and that was a very girly, uh, girly scream. Glad we're here for that. Glad we experienced this. this Blooper is... reel number 69. Yeah, infinity. Anyone out there still <laughs> listening at this point, please clip that girly scream because that was a 10 out of 10 screech. My goodness. But pulling up a little bit further in this stretch, this is where things really got crazy. With the fast water pushing right along the bank, it created the perfect feeding lane for hungry trout. And pulling five more fish out of a run like this in less than 10 minutes is almost unheard of anywhere else in the United States, any of these major fly fishing destinations that you think of. And I've spoken on this before, but if you can find a hole like this in the Driftless region, it can absolutely turn your day around. Or in our case, add yet another cherry on top. I mean, I don't know what to tell you at this point. <laughs> we'll see him back. Bye. So how how many more can we realistically get out of here? One. <laughs> What's the overall? You haven't even hit that piece yet. No way. Right. This is just prime time evening bite here in the Driftless. I mean, it's stupid. It is just. Stupid. Well, see what you should have been doing is rigging up the whole time. Rigging up a nice uh, little dry fly. I'm gonna come mouse in here. This wouldn't be a bad spot. I don't think you're gonna find. If you had a really small mouse, maybe. I was telling you this entire time. Holy shit. Right there. Oh, so that's where you wanted me to hit. <laughs> These are just some dogging ass browns. Thank God, dude. This creek is broken. Yeah, I'm gonna no net Nancy you. 
and this is a bad idea. I know it is. That might be the, the best one of the night. That is 110 percent the best one of the night. Wow, what a freaking fish! That shoulders on this boy. What? Oh my god! <laughs> what a night, man. Will you let me do this, please, sir? Will you let me? Uh, come on, come on. Oh, got him. Okay. All right. He is off here on me. Oh gosh. He's back. <laughs> what a night. All right, all right. I'm the going. entire time, I'm like, right there. Yeah, you want me to hit that spot the right entire there. time. I'm like, right I'll get to it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like that one. That one. Bless America. One more. Give it a good yeet. Really eat it out there. The side angle will help cut, uh, maybe make it go farther too. What do you mean? I like to, to side angle it. it. It kind of cuts the uh, the wind if there is any. Keep it low. Hey, there it is. Hey, set, set. Always look away. Yes, 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 yes. Well, how about that? Only took four misses. We got one. Last cast of the night. <laughs> That's awesome, man. There you go. Low light muncher. Thank you much, dude. It's been sick. Tuesday goon sesh, big fishy knocks. Let's freaking go, man. This is awesome. Sometimes you just need to know when to call it quits and late in the afternoon on a slow Friday is oftentimes when my mind is somewhere else and productivity it plummets to almost zero. So knowing full and well that I was only a liability to my day job at this point, it was time to find some sunshine and ditch the worries of a work week for just a bit. So there was no better time to load up the truck and head in the direction of a possible evening bite. And I can't exactly tell why, but windy back roads and quaint towns of the upper Midwest, they have such a charm to them. Generational farms filled with cows and corns stoke up romantic daydreams that seemingly teleport me from one little town to the next. This daydream cycle was finally broken by the pop of gravel as I pulled into the parking lot. The excitement of the unknown welled up in the pit of my stomach, reminding me that this was yet another stream I have yet to wet a line. There aren't many times where us as trout anglers can sit and watch our quarry for an extended period of time. Often, I find myself blindly casting purely at the hope of trout rather than having eyes on the physical specimen. So when the opportunity comes up like this, I do my best to soak in every single second. And the way this trout stream meanders so close to the walking trail, it allows the odd passerby like myself to have an incredible perspective down on the schools of feeding trout. Close to the visitor center, there were multiple runs and deep pools with untold numbers of trout. And from that distance, I could tell there was a fair mix of big brookies and nice sized browns throughout the different pools. There seemed to be a certain pecking order over the feeding lanes and on several occasions, I saw fish jockey and shift for new positions. I especially love seeing the browns so up close and personal, but a lot of the streams here in the Driftless have been taken over by these aggressive non-natives. However, just looking at the signs posted in my hike, it would seem as though this stream is under specific management to help reestablish the native fish stock, which is always nice to see. And I cannot emphasize enough how much I love dropping the rods every once in a while and just watching fish be fish. But as intriguing as this was, I could feel the sun shifting across my cheeks, reminding me that time was currently at a premium and soon a blanket of darkness would cover this valley. So 
it was time to slide downstream a bit further and avoid the weary eye of the wild trout swimming in this stream. And that little brown was mission accomplished in my book. Anymore, when I'm out and about, one fish is more than enough to satisfy my yearning for trout and make the whole endeavor more than worth it. Everything after that is what I like to call pure gravy. So as I made my way out of the creek and back up onto the trail, I can't really be upset at what transpired next. Rolling up to yet another creekside overlook, I could see a stack of hungry browns holding tight to their feeding lanes and occasionally sipping off the top. Instead of being a passive observer, I decided to give this one a cast. With all the overgrowth stretching down into the stream bed, it made a downstream drift fairly difficult, but this was a better option than trying to hike downstream of the active pool and casting back up to them. With how low and clear the water was, any surface disturbance would have surely disrupted the pool and most likely spooked them back to their undercut hideaways. And well, the only reason I know this is because not soon after I found a decent casting angle, a botched hook set on an active fish did exactly that. But all hope was not lost because this active pod settled into a comfortable feeding pattern again a bit further downstream this time. And as luck would seem to have it, the fishing gods had given me a prime opportunity to right this wrong and get another crack at another eager trout. Unfortunately, the fishing gods, they tend to be quite fickle at times, and as frustrating as this might seem, in water like this, you sometimes, you just have to take that loss. A lot of the time, these fish will do what I call a domino effect, and so when one spooks, well, there goes the rest of them all at once. But with the nature of these Driftless Region streams, I had every bit of confidence that we would at least have a chance at a few more before the nightbirds started to sing their sweet tune. Very much facing the wrong way. I felt like a real joker missing that last fish, and I must have looked the part too. 
The cattle in the open pasture were giving me funny looks as I pushed further into the valley. And all around, evening was really starting to set in, and the combination of cottonwood floating in the air and flies buzzing around made it look like it was snowing in the summer. And the long shadows made the fish much more eager to eat, and this was yet another run that was absolutely loaded with fish. But my approach, it must have been a bit too high and sloppy because as soon as I got to casting, the whole pod, it shut down pretty hard. I hope at this point, I'm not sounding apathetic about my angling adventure. I had plenty of opportunities to catch and hook fish, both on the dry and the dry dropper, but clearly my mind was still stuck on the winding back roads and the small town daydreams. I was underperforming as an angler on almost every single metric, but hey, that's okay. Like I'd mentioned earlier, the hard part was complete. We caught one fish on the day and got rid of that skunk. Hell, we even caught a second fish on the dry, which made for the purest of gravy. So in reality, just being present in this valley and having a front row seat to the ushering in of the twilight was nothing short of magic. I was lucky enough to see a brand new creek absolutely loaded with fish while at the same time getting to meet some of the supporting characters playing their part in this spectacle. This may sound extremely cliche and I apologize in advance, but every now and then the process of physically catching fish can take a back seat to simply taking a deep breath and soaking in all the beauty surrounding you. For me, this part of the world it's like that one friend we all have. Many of you still watching, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter how long you've been apart, but as soon as you're reunited, it feels like the good old days once again. So, sitting on the roof of this old farmhouse, I can't help but feel extremely lucky to be back in the Driftless region. And as the sun retires for the day, I cannot wait to see what next week has in store. So far, we've inched our way through Iowa and worked our way up to Wisconsin, but on this late afternoon, it was time to make that trifecta and mosey my way on up to Minnesota. And it's pretty crazy to think that from Blake's farm, I can access the best parts of any side of the Driftless in an hour or less. So as I continue to pass small ag towns moving north, I could not help but think how lucky I was. And even though the drive would be solo this time, the fishing would not. We planned to meet at 4.30 on the dot, and at 4.29, I rolled into the access point to meet a familiar face. This is Beck. Much like a lot of the fishy folk I meet through my travels, Ryan Becker started out as a random DM on Instagram, and through various conversations back and forth over our mutual appreciation for the Driftless region and love of fly fishing, this helped spawn our first trip a few springs ago. We hit up one of his favorite honey holes in Minnesota and had an absolute blast. And that's all it took. Even when I left for New Mexico, he would always keep me updated on everything that was happening in the Driftless region. And it's always so funny to think how just one trip like this can establish a friendship that lasts a long time. So naturally, being back in his neck of the woods, I hit him up and we made something happen. A lot of the streams in the area have great easement sections that the Minnesota DNR have helped to buy up for us anglers. And the catch is that some of these easements are hard to access with all the farms dotted throughout the watersheds. So you have to hike a few miles to get the good stuff or run the risk of trespassing. And since these private landowners are extremely generous with their land to even allow anglers to fish the streams that run through them, I suggest no one trespasses. Luckily for us tonight, Beck was very friendly with some of the locals and gained permission to access these streams through the farmer's cornfield. So we took off towards the stream and the scene was set for an absolutely gorgeous evening in the Minnesota Driftless. Ah, yeah, blood. yeah, I'm already seeing them spooked there. Yeah, so you see that bush in the middle of the, that to the right, those two right there. Yeah. If you can get a cast up by that shade, okay. you know, that's, there'll be fish sitting there that won't have spoon. Ah, mother. There. Oh. Ah, I feel like I'm spooking. I, I can see him kind of spooking. Yeah. I can already see him spooking up to the other yeah, right. Yeah, we can bounce up to the deep. 
it's tough, but when the light gets lower. Oh no no, I have I have every every expectation that we probably won't find fish for a little while. At least my oh you'll catch this hole here is deep and it's like I, uh, thick rapid. <laughs> I'm I'm running so I'm on. I think this is technically week two. Yeah of the driftless yeah. and so my excuse of i'm still getting used to the driftless is like wearing thin crystal clear spring creeks and bluebird days are the kiss of death to any prospecting angler we were still riding the line between afternoon and evening and expectations had to be tapered in a major way becker and i both knew that this first bit it could be a little bit difficult and it was just a matter of tweaking our approach and doing our best to stay out of sight yeah, yeah, oh dude, I'm not even I'm not even starting to sweat. Not from the fishing at least. I know I've talked about this before, but I'd like to go over it one more time because in this afternoon part of our session, we were really feeling it hard. And that is the domino effect. So runs like these in a creek this healthy can easily hold 10 to 20 fish of all size ranges. And with this many fish, they tend to really spread out through any and all available holding water in the stream. So that many fish means a lot of eyes on every single move you make. And once one spooks, well, <laughs> that's all folks. That first domino falls and then so do the rest. In this situation, keeping a low profile is never a bad idea. And I'll oftentimes take super wide approaches before I even think about casting. But even that, can sometimes not be enough. And that's why we kept a pretty quick pace for the first few hours of this trip. And when conditions are tough like this, you just gotta know when to hold them and when to fold them. It really is a magical time to be in the drift. I did see, when I was getting filmed with that cap, I did see a caddis crawling around me. Hey! Yes, crawling around the cap, man. Almost exactly that size. But it doesn't look like a splash of take out of the caddis. You can see there's something dancing. Kind of, yeah, we... Look at those trout, man. They're so spoiled. I know. They just get to eat nah, and eat and eat. And eat. Nice hibernation in the wintertime and then back at it. Seeing the fish really start to key in on the evening hatch gave us a lot of confidence that things should start turning around here soon. The shadows were growing on the left side of the bank as the sun was starting to set and the sporadic clouds gave us a brief reprieve from the glare. Like a fishy fuse, you could just feel the entire valley was just minutes away from popping off. Spotting an extremely active pod of rising fish Playtime was now over. I turned my trout sneak levels all the way up and pulled out my best Steph Curry downtown Buster Brown casting for this next spot. Talk about going for the yard though. I feel like I had to cast uh, half a county over to get to him. Not gonna lie, that was pretty sweet to watch. <laughs> well, that one like eight. He, he like kissed right it. Next to he kissed spot. it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this is a great little fish. Okay. Awesome. All that right. looks good. I see what you mean. <laughs> that was so sick. The skunk was finally off and I managed to get a few more looks out of this hole. I was running a double dry setup with a smaller mayfly tailing a decent sized caddis. And even though I couldn't get them to stay pinned, it was a really good sign that we were getting looks at both of the flies. And I think at this point, it was safe to say that the evening bite had officially started. And Working our way further up, we stopped at a particularly juicy run that Becker insisted I get first crack at. Given the set and setting, I can understand why, because this is one of his favorite runs in the section. Trying not to let him down, I managed to pick off one towards the back of the pool without spooking the more productive parts further towards the top, but after that one swam pack, I proceeded to drop the bag on a few separate occasions.
Oh no! I was just gonna say, be ready on that one. That was epic. I knew that cast was getting that, bit. It, it was just, it just felt good. It was just like, yes, this is it. Yeah, they hugged that bank and you wrapped it. I'm gonna back. I'm gonna back out of this one with head head held low. But I missed way too many. I think I need to change my flies. They're. Uh, they just missing it. Or I, I can't tell. On? A couple of them I'm connecting with, but a couple of them just bent out the hooks completely. This is where having a fishing buddy is nice because even though I screwed everything up, Becker knew how to successfully set the hook and proceeded to find a fantastic fish out of this run. With a little little bit of spice to him, man. Dude, that was epic. That was so cool. <laughs> wow. Right. And he just came up and clobbered it. Yeah. So there was one that was doing cartwheels over here. I saw. Yeah, I was seeing him over here as I was and then trying I to put cast. Just midstream. I mean, we we got all the way up. To the it's top. always so funny <laughs> to me how there's almost a switch that goes off where the fish go from completely uninterested in any and all offerings to porpoising straight out of the water at the mere twitch of any imposter insect life and. It's like walking into a dark room and turning on the lights. The shadows started to grow long over the hills and we got a front row seat to this switch being flipped. In every direction, the sound of a driftless evening began to echo on either side. The symphony of insects and birds, paired with a slight breeze and stream, is completely enveloping to the senses. Unfortunately, the mic will never do this siren song justice and the lens does a real disservice to the vibrance you see all around you. As the caddis began to swarm in full force, I hope that you can take my word that this is truly amazing and maybe you witness it yourself one day. Becker and I proceeded to catch quite a few more fish in the dwindling evening light, but each run we rolled up to showed the potential for untold numbers of fish. Between the caddis and mayfly combo we were throwing in their direction, 
they held no bias on which they preferred. So as the cows looked with caution and the calves stared with curiosity, it was time to leave this dream stream behind us and head back to the trucks. This incredible evening was now over. That'll film, baby. Hey, man, that's a wrap. Okay, <laughs> that's fucking... You got a good little clip for the... <laughs> Heading east seems a bit odd. Landmarks, they're familiar, but heading the opposite direction certainly makes those reference points a bit more difficult to spot. When I was living in Madison, my driftless travels would always have me running from the sun rather than chasing it. Now, there was not much of a chance of seeing the sun on this morning with the threatening rain popping up all across the driftless, but I got an early start to this adventure and as I kept trudging along, I was starting to feel it wasn't early enough. With light in the sky as I passed over the border, regret was trickling down my spine knowing that I could have spared a few snoozes on my alarm this morning. Not saying that it was a race to get to the access point, but it certainly is advantageous to be there first. There's a reason this stream is so well known. Quantity and quality of fish on every section pulls in anglers from all around. So when I rolled up to an empty parking lot, the weight and pressure of expectations were lifted off quite a bit. I've said this before, but there is no end of water to fish in the Driftless region. From Iowa, Minnesota, to even Wisconsin, there is so much fishable trout water. The only catch is that a lot of the watersheds are relatively small and are only able to support a few anglers per section. But now that we had established position on my favorite section, I could suit up and rig up a bit more at ease. And after a car ride like that, a bit of stretching is always in order. And I looked at my watch and still had a few minutes to kill before my fishy buddy would arrive. So I took advantage of that extra time to drink my lukewarm coffee and watch the swallows into the bridge. This bustling community of chirps need to be doing their best to take full advantage of the gap in the rain. I had just left the bridge and picked up a ride when a familiar Tacoma moseyed its way down the road and that must have been Tupper. Mr. Tupper, how the hell are you, man? Glad we're making this happen. Dude, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, you holy too, man. Back in the day, he was my fishy guru teaching me the beauty of the weeknight adventure. He is the archetype for squeezing everything out of life and most of all, a genuinely good person to talk with. This is Tupper. As fate would have it, we were fishing the same river where we met so many years ago and it was a brief conversation. You know the classic, hey, how's it going? Any luck? That led to trading some flies and exchanging Instagram handles, and something as simple as that. It seems strange that stopping to talk to a fellow angler would then lead to countless fishy memories shared and a solid friendship forged. Now, at this point, we hadn't seen each other for about a year and some change, so we had a lot of catching up to do while Tupper got rigged. My, uh, my job went full-time remote, so... Oh, really? Yeah, I'm just traveling. Hell yeah. So I've got a month here. So you can live wherever you want now. Dude. I'll do a month here, a month on, or a month and a half on the east side of Idaho, Idaho Falls. Okay. So targeting Wyoming, the Tetons, the Yellowstone, all that. And then I'll jump over to the west side, Boise. Spend a month and a half there. Yeah. Doing all the old adventures and kind of capturing those memories again. And then I'll jump back down to Salt Lake and then to, to I think it's Scottsdale. Okay. And then back home for the holidays and weddings and shit. So Dude. that's as far as I got planned right now. While the morning rain clung to the underbrush, wearing waders for this session might have been the right call. The morning temps were just cold enough to make the possibility of wet wading semi miserable, at least for the first few hours. So while Tupper stopped to get his rig in order, I slithered in with some enthusiastic dry fly sippers in my crosshairs. We were still in the midst of the morning bite and I managed to capitalize on this first run. It is extremely satisfying to pull up to a random stretch of river and catch fish on both of the flies tied on the night before. The caddis and a small mayfly were the absolute ticket. But as that second fish slid back, Tup was rigged up and ready to go, so I gave him the floor.
Oh, hello. Hold him there. Awesome. Let's see him back. Boom. Now, Tub, was that textbook or what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was awesome. That was so good. I was like, zoom, 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 and right now, set the hook. Perfect. You did it. Then he grabs it. I mean, that was, that was as good as it gets, man. The skunk was now off and the pressure of the day was very much behind us. The snowball had been formed and was now rolling down the hill. And in a long fishing adventure like this, momentum is key and we were no doubt building up speed. This particular section of the big green can be productive at times, but the fishing, in my opinion, kind of takes a backseat to the overall aesthetic. Walking through the tall grass with the farm in the background is so picturesque and the perfect backdrop for lazy dry fly casting. And it is such a luxury that Tupper and I can willingly take turns casting at active pods of fish, with each run having the potential to hold double digits in both numbers and size, there is no point in being selfish with the rod. Plus, I find quite a bit of satisfaction stepping back and capturing the moment behind the lens. Yeah, buddy. Good stuff. There we go. <laughs> Take some of that. Woo. I guess All it's right. pretty close to be a 30. Oh. <laughs> Speed stop you. <laughs> I'm keeping that in. I hope you realize that. Oh, brother. Yeah, I don't think they're up there. <laughs> Getting as far away from those power lines as possible, we kept a solid pace, pushing our way further upstream. And with a few bad casts and botched hook sets, I was able to spook an entire pod of active fish, which felt really good. But I did manage to grab up one nymphing consolation prize. But at this next run, it was time for Tup to put on an absolute dry fly clinic. There it is, Tup. Way to go. That was so sick. That was really cool. <laughs> the way he came and just want that and then jumped a couple times too. <laughs> Pretty oh, cool. Wow. That's some butter, buddy. Oh. <laughs> All right, nice fish, man. Woo. Hey, yo. Dude, come on, that was sweet. <laughs> Good stuff, just in this flat stuff too. That's so strange. <laughs> it is, it's weird, man. Dude, that was so cool. <laughs> it's funny, it's like right when it hits. Just smack down. Oh, I, I can, they're not even spooked yet. I can see them on the offset on the moss. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. So yeah, this might be, this might be a good run. So funny. Nice. You sure you don't want to toss in here? <laughs> no, dude, this is all you. All right. So right, right, right on that border of the uh, the moss and the sand, there's one I can see him. He's tailing back and forth. It's actually a nice fish. I, I just saw it. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, just right out in the middle of the highway there. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'll take that. Hell yeah, dude. It's like an arcade game. <laughs> Just playing whack-a-mole. Totally. That's it, yeah. That's a good fish. Mm -hmm. right, whenever you're ready, see that, see that pretty boy back. Thank you, much obliged, sir. Yeah. Thank you. That's sick, man. Give me some knocks for that. Do me <laughs> put this back in. Sure. The double-edged sword of a stream this healthy is that you have a lot of eyes scrutinizing every single move you make. So sometimes you have to be willing to crack a few eggs to make that omelet. And what I'm trying to say is that I will spook the majority of the run downstream to be able to target the fish holding in structure, kind of like this hole right here. This prevents that domino effect of 30 plus fish sounding off the alarm and blowing your cover. Um. Um. Yeah! Oh, dude, that was a good fish! Oh, that was a really good fish! <laughs>
<laughs> God bless America. I can just tell by his side he looks nice and buttery. Now, Dude. now, don't tell your friends. We're gonna pull you out. I'm not gonna tell your friends, okay? <laughs> oh, you are gorgeous. Look at your little par marks. All right, lovely. See ya. Go that way. Okay. <laughs> Deep breaths. When he's not casting a fly rod, he's shooting a bow and arrow. <laughs> yeah, I got pretty darn good at these in New Mexico. Yeah. Cause a lot of those little streams, man. You don't have much casting room at all. Nice. Yes. Dude. <laughs> That's a little cheeky one right there, huh? <laughs> Vibe is back. We're back. 100% back. Oh, my Atlanta. Look at you. That's a beauty. Beauty boy. Just like that. Thank you, sir. They're so beautiful. Hell yeah! Nice. Just let him go right there. Cool. You were chasing cutties up in New Mexico, and they're they're naturally reproducing yep. there. Yep. Real grands. Yeah. Just awesome. so cool, man. Yeah. So cool. Like each one of them is like a little little piece of work, little piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like the brookies here. They've been they've been pushed out of a lot of their natural range, mm -hmm. which sucks. Did you watch it? Yeah, no, no, I couldn't see it. I was just, I was looking at the indicator. Really? Oh, that's a nicer fish. Yeah. It's a chunky boy. Cool fish, man. <laughs> just a quick look ski there. All right, lovely. See ya, go that way. Okay. <laughs> That's how we do it, baby. With that last bow and arrow muncher pulled out of its tree limb hideout, the rest of the pod was surely spooked. So I think at this point, it was time to move on. And all the fishy activity had pushed the early morning well towards this afternoon. And while we sat down for a quick snack and a beer, Tupper said that he spotted something in the water. Come here, b Buy me now, sweetheart. <laughs> you do not like that, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. do you? Okay. There it is. She's missing an eye on that side too. Yes. Oh. Woo. Oh, baby. All right. Thank you. Sorry to harass. In Missouri, I do that all the time. You yeah, be right? fishing a creek, you'd be like, my cousin would be like, oh, what's that? I'm like, I'll get it. <laughs> I bet she's up here laying eggs, though. Go mm -hmm. that way, go. Go that way, go, 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 go. Yeah, I'm sure all those fish were like, oh my God, we gotta get out of here. He's like, man, I don't think I spooked that, that those fish. It's like, what's there worse than two dipshits spooking yeah. the fish? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a big old snapping turtle. <laughs> Snappers are never good to see on a trout stream, but clearly that dino wasn't making a dent in the trout population. And if you don't believe me, this next run should be proof enough. Oh, did you see that? That was two. That was as close to double as double gets. He didn't even take that. That was weird. Oh, he took that though. Yeah, that one took that. For the big snack. Yes, sir. We got hey, little guys gotta eat, man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, thank you. I swear, sir, you have made my day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Nice, man. <laughs> this is nuts. This is good. This is going too hard. Yeah. 13 fish hooked and landed, and another 20 plus bites missed. This dry fly fervor was nothing short of outstanding. And no clue why mid afternoon had these fish so keyed in on the dry bite. But a few early season hopper munchers were not questioned, just welcomed. But like most good things in life, this fever pitch dry fly bite had to come to an end and angling reality gave us a little slap in the face in this fourth quarter of our day. I should not have done that. There's my climbing trees again. Starting us off, I decided it would be really fun to try and catch trees instead of catching fish. Imagine that. And since I have a strict no flies left behind policy, I had no other choice but to go get it. Don't worry, Mike, I know CPR. <laughs> Tup was getting the same nasty treatment as the once eager dry fly sippers were now nose up, actively avoiding any and all offerings. So Slowing down and recalibrating, we both knew we needed to shape up our act. Luckily for me, Tup was able to do a fair bit of heavy lifting for the both of us with the last fish of the day. A lot of uncased caddis, this is crazy. Oh dude. That's a fish right there, isn't it? Come on. Where's that strap to? I got you. Okay, I got it. All right. Heck yeah. That's the fish. That is the fish. <laughs> Holy cow, brother. Oh, he just realized we're here. Oh, yeah, dude. Let's freaking go. Look at that hopper muncher. Wow. Yeah. Holy cow. I'll give you some fishy nuts for that. <laughs> Yo, did you see the porpoise? He kind of came yeah. over for it. Dude, I know from like... Oh my gosh, that's the fish of the day. Yeah. Sir, you have just found yourself dude. the fish of the day. Holy cow, he is fired up, dude. Oh yeah. My lands. My lands, good sir. Look what you've done. Hey, dude. Let me get on drink here. Holy cow. If you're going to get the fly out, I can hold the net for you so you can get two hands on it. Okay. Dude. That's a basket yeah. filler right there, buddy. Dude. <laughs> hey, Tup, I think they're munching hoppers already. Yeah. <laughs> hopper season. Come on. Man. It's officially hopper season. Great fish, man. Beauty. You, bud. Dude, let's go. That was so incredible. That was so cool. He that just was came up wild. for it. Woo! Yeah. That's the fish right there. That's it. Game over, baby. Big fat dubs for the boys. Those are those are what I like to call oh shit moments. Yeah. Where you you hooked into him and I I like under my breath I went oh shit. Yeah. And then I could I'm like your body language and he's like oh yeah. shit. Yeah. This is, this is an above average fish. I'm like, all right, get him on the reel, get him on the reel. Yep, yep, no, that was a good call. We can just walk home after that one. That's a, <laughs> that's a, how, juxtaposed to my little dinker. I'm like, my last fish of the day, yay. <laughs> Woo. Oh, wow. What a fish, what a day, and it could not have been spent with a better dude. Meeting fishy folk on the water or over the internet is always such an interesting concept. 
the anchor that is this funny game of flinging feathers and fur is something that we can always relate back to. This binary world we find ourselves in is all but forgotten when there are more important tasks at hand, like double hauling dries and giving endless fishy nucks to those we call friends. So far, this driftless trip has mainly consisted of catching up with old friends, and that was kind of the original goal, if I have to be honest, but with this trip reaching a midpoint, I felt like I needed to get out and do some hardcore fishing. Now, normally, I find myself being quite the solo act with my wild adventures, so this weekend, I had to break free for a bit of alone time. Setting my sights dead north, I made my way to a quiet corner of the Driftless just outside of Decorah, Iowa. And of course, I could rough it, but why in the world would I do that when there are good people with super cool Airbnbs out there? Folks, Welcome to the Little Red Schoolhouse. Folks, we have landed at our pad for the next few days. This is a beautiful little Airbnb tucked way back in the hills. And like always, I just gotta give a huge shout out to the host here. You know, it's always amazing traveling across the country, how willing people are to kind of work with me. So it's just, it's so awesome to see. And if you guys have any interest in staying in this place for yourself, if you're ever in the Iowa Driftless, I've got everything linked down below, so make sure, make sure, make sure to go check them out. But yeah, nothing left to do but uh, get everything in and kind of get settled for the night because we got a lot of fishing to do in the morning. With everything settled in for the night and plenty of sunlight left, a bit more exploring was in order. I had no service and a full tank of gas, and that is the perfect recipe for a good time. If you've never done it, you might be surprised how back row gravel pops and good music melt the hours away quite quickly. But up and over a few hills, I saw something through the trees that made me tap my brakes for a bit. Sitting on the twisted old cedar and hearing the enthusiastic calls of the valley songbirds was an excellent way to usher in this solo fishing trip. This perfect perch helps any wayward driftless wanderer get a perspective of the area's topography. And with a slight breeze and the distant sound of the upper Iowa River, I could have sat there well into the night. But I will say, once I got back in the truck and the sun went down, there wasn't much else worthy of filming. The flicker of candlelight and turning of pages didn't last long before the Sandman coerced me into a deep sleep. If it weren't for that rude alarm I had regrettably set the night before, I could have stayed tucked into that cozy schoolhouse all day. And even though that would have been really nice, a threatening forecast was set to jeopardize the fishing plans for the entire day. So, with no time to waste, I shotgunned some iced coffee and punched it to the first destination. Now, I didn't get any air cresting the hills, but my god, I sure came close. I was speed racer on those dusty back roads. With limited space at the access point, it was imperative that I made it there early.
Oh wow, that's a big brook trout. Oh wow, come on buddy. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, that's a big brook trout. <laughs> Holy hell. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are you joking me right now? Well, if you can see the Gucci bags under my eyes, you can tell this was an early morning. I always like to get out early as possible on this creek just because the morning bite, in my experience, has always been best. And I was a little worried when I first got down here, just the way that this creek has changed so much. So, I don't know, I've been coming here for about three years-ish. First time, all brookies. Second time, all brookies. Third time, I caught a brown. And then next thing I know, there's a big old beaver dam. The next time I came, it was really dammed up and then there was just, there were browns everywhere. And so when I showed up today, First thing I caught was a brown, and then subsequently I've just been seeing beaver dam after beaver dam and the beaver himself. So it's uh, weird to see it change and kind of mold. I hope the DNR is aware of this because yeah, this is a very special stream, you know, home of the wild native population of brook trout here in the Iowa Driftless side. And so I just, it's a really cool resource and I hope it's not getting, uh, I don't know, forgotten about maybe, but yeah, that brook trout was an absolute tank the dimensions on that thing don't even make sense for this kind of water and of course all caught on my grandpa's bamboo and reel this is actually a really cool story i'll uh, link it down below you can see ooh, the video right here look at that new mexico i kind of just go over the story and you know why it's so special but i don't get it out often and i don't uh i don't think it deserves to be out very often but uh, every now and again it needs to get a little water on it and uh, a little bend in that <laughs> a little bend in that rod Oh, gosh darn. Well, I cast it in there and immediately got hit and broke off by something big. So they seem to be aggressive and I'm gonna switch up to more of a streamer, trying to elicit a more aggressive bite and uh, yeah, ditch the hopper and just go straighter for the leech. Oh, like that. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Oh, that was so sick. Oh my gosh, that's another nice brook. Come here. Oh my gosh. Yes! Oh my gosh. That's another big brook trout. What the heck? Are you kidding me? That is another tank brookie. Holy cow. Pretty simple leech pattern, and he just absolutely hoovered that up. That was, that was wild. That's exactly what we're looking for. With uncertainty at an all-time high, catching two brookies of that caliber completely made my day. It is truly hard to explain the feeling of relief and excitement that comes from a gamble like this actually paying off. But with this beaver pond fished out for the time being, a move upstream was required. The seemingly stagnant frog water was left behind, and the stream returned to its meandering ways further up the valley. Now, from my previous trips, I could recall that the closer you got to the private property boundary, the smaller the water gets. Can't confirm, way too skinny. Even though we had to double back a bit, I took my time to slow down and look at some of the finer details surrounding me. I saw no end of terrestrial bugs on my hike back to the productive water. This could be a major clue as to why these fish are so healthy, and to say that this place was buggy would be an understatement. Crunch after crunch through the wet grass sent grasshoppers and katydids scattering in every direction. Even though it was tempting to put on a plump dry fly after seeing those critters, I stuck with what had been working and kept tossing that leech. Okay, well, he just flopped, and as if on cue, the rain has started in. And it's kind of light right now, but it's supposed to be thunderstorms throughout the day, so that's why I got out so early to try and avoid that. And yeah, three tank brookies to start and, well, maybe finish our day. I don't know how many more fish we're gonna get, but 
We'll keep pushing, see if we can't press our luck, but when the rain starts coming in, we gotta skedaddle, so let's go. Oh yeah, baby, that's a brook trout right there. Yes! That's a beaut! Oh my gosh. Think you wanted that? Absolute T-bone. Oh no. Well, that was easily the most beautiful fish of the day, and I dropped him because I'm in a panic now that it's raining, like a true goon. Wow, that was awesome. It's gonna make things more difficult, but this is why we carry the rain jacket. Oh, there it is. Yes. Holy cow. Oh, my lands. Is that the biggest brookie of the day? Could that be the biggest brookie of the day? Oh my God. <laughs> ah. <laughs> what in the, what in Sam Hill is going on? See you, buddy. Yet another big brookie is back, and oh my gosh, I, I, I'm kind of flabbergasted that this is even working, which is why I hesitate to even tell you my rig. I mean, like I mentioned before, this is my grandpa's rod and reel. The bamboo, it's like a seven footer. It's not practical at all, especially when you're throwing streamers. I mean, it's kind of a smaller leech pattern, but still, we're whipping streamers out there, and these big ass brookies are just hammering it. I think with the surface disturbance and the rain moving in, it's just snapped them on, and they, I mean, they're ready to munch, man. This is this is so much better than I thought it was gonna go, and I'm I, <laughs> I'm ecstatic, man. This is crazy. Gosh, the size caliber of these fish is just insane. See ya, buddy. Thanks for playing. After that last fish swam back, the spotty showers kept making their way in and out of the area. Downstream of the big beaver ponds, South Pine looks a lot more like the stream of old. Nice bends with deeper pools at the back, all just absolutely loaded with fish. And just because I was being lazy and didn't want to change rigs, I kept throwing a streamer. I did manage to link up with a few more little brookies and one more brown, but even with the rain cover, I was still spooking a lot of fish. The apathy that comes with catching that many big fish is always a weird feeling. The cares of performing seem to fly out the window and a botched run stings a lot less than the pesky nettle hiding in the underbrush. But with heavier rains forecasted for the late morning and early afternoon, I knew it would be best not to press my already stretched luck. Wet boots and a banged up leech were the physical proof that today was a success. But there was some part of me that felt a little conflicted about leaving. The tall grass passed on its collected rain, seemingly trying to weigh me down as the valley songbirds whistled their rainy day siren song. It felt like I should stay. But with much meaner storms looming over the hills and the faint echo of thunder getting louder, I had to get back to the truck as soon as possible. It was time to hunker down at the schoolhouse for a bit and wait out these storms. Once I'd stripped down from this morning's adventure, the gentle pitter-patter of the rain was the sweet lullaby needed to put me down for a much anticipated nap. And 
I must say, it was rather hard to get up. It's one of those body in motion, stays in motion kind of things, but I eventually did get up and I kind of explored the space a bit more. I always love to see the little details that the hosts leave to make a guest stay that much more special. And as I was studying the various maps of Iowa, I noticed the sun was peeking through the windows and that meant it was time to saddle back up and get ready for session two. With the same fervor from this morning, I screamed across the ag fields and cow pastures in order to reach yet another honey hole. The windows were down, the music was loud, and I was having a hard time believing this was the same day. It was incredible to see the region spring back to life now that the afternoon sun was high in the sky. When I pulled into the access point, I would be lying to you if I said I wasn't excited. For lack of a better term, you could just feel the good vibes in the air. Now, in hindsight, that could have just been post-rain humidity. But regardless, I had a certain pep in my step while I got suited up and sipped on my sour. I just felt like this was going to be a beautiful evening session. Best of luck, fellas. So as I grab my kit, I bid the friendly bridge fisherman good luck and I pass through the unworn game trail. And the nostalgia of long past summer trips, it hit me so very hard and the almost neon green foliage was just like I had remembered and it made the deep blue of the creek absolutely pop. And the closer I got within casting range, I could see that the fish were rising consistently on something. What exactly? Not exactly sure. I had a hunch they would be looking up, and it didn't take very long to confirm that my double dry rig was the right choice for the locals. With that fish back in the blue, the evening session skunk was off, and the fish really seemed to be looking up. That's a good fish. Yes, baby, come on. Stay with me here. Yes. Oh, that's a blast. You can't even see it, it's so far back. He monched that, holy cow. What an absolutely gorgeous fish. That adipose, oh my gosh. The driftless, what a day. What an absolute day. That's a long range rifle I shot right there. That's a sniper. Yeah, there we go. That's so sick. Had to go to the yard on that one there, buddy. Every piece of trout water has a certain learning curve to it, be it a lake, river, or a stream. Some are a bit sharper than others. In my opinion, most of the Driftless region is fairly simple to pattern out. On any side, be it Iowa, Wisconsin, or Minnesota, most of the creeks and streams are going to share characteristics which allow us anglers to get familiar with certain patterns. However, in my experience, the spring creeks like this one I'm fishing tonight have a bit sharper learning curve. With the crystal clear water, high fish densities, and long, slow sections, it can be difficult for some new anglers to figure out. This is where I like to implement my hold em or fold em tactic. I skip over a lot of water and spook untold numbers of fish. But there's a good reason for this. My legs are strong and I can make the effort to reach more productive water as long as I maintain a certain pace. But even when I'm able to find a good piece of water with fishy structure, be it a riffle, run, or a nice deep pool, it still doesn't mean you're always gonna connect with fish. As you can see, I missed more than my fair share of nice fish as I marched up the valley. Now, I could blame it on a fast take from a wily wild brown trout, but in my heart of hearts, I think the sour I was drinking earlier might have something to do with my slow reaction time. And bringing it back stream side, I was thinking my fly selection might be part of the problem. So as I stopped to recalibrate a bit, the river spirits sent me a good luck charm. 
With how cold the water actually is, I am always amazed any reptile can eke out an existence here. But with little thought given to what I actually saw, I had to go grab my new good omen and give it a thorough inspection. And as if on cue, that dino swam back downstream and our evening bite upstream turned on. Oh, dude, where are you going with that? Nice fish. See you, buddy. That's a big fish, that's a big fish, that's a big fish. That's a big fish. That's a good fish. Oh, he's wrapped up. He's wrapped up. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go. Yeah, dude, that's the fish we wanted. Oh, and he sucked her down just right. Oh my gosh. Ah. This is definitely more of the caliber fish you want when you come here, man. That is phenomenal. There's no end of them, too. <laughs> See you, friend. Thank you very much. Okay, and that dandy of a fish is back. And on this bamboo, that nice fish, I mean, it feels like an absolute tank. I can't remember what weight this is. I think it's a five, but the bamboo definitely has a little bit more bend to it. But if you guys are interested in the story of this rod and this reel, I kind of go over it, uh, I don't know, a couple months back in New Mexico. So here's that video right now. Ooh, look at that, me in New Mexico with a nice hat on. <laughs> very cool, right? I don't know, it's a very interesting story. Grandpa's rod, grandpa's reel, and yeah, it's doing me more than fine on this Driftless Night, man. That's so good. Yes, yeah, dude, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yes, they want the caddis. Oh, and he monched it again. Good lordy. Sir. That's absolutely gorgeous, man. I love it. Not too shabby. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Come again, eat my caddis. Come on, baby. <laughs> Woo. Hard to tell what that is. It's some kind of caddis variant, but uh, that's what the last two have been munching on. That's really nice. It'd be cool if there was a hatch tonight. That'd be so epic, man. Oh, sweetheart. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. It's all going wrong. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't do that. Ah! Oh, this is a good fish. Oh, get away from those logs. You suck. <laughs> Yes! Yes! That's what we want, baby! Let's go! Woo! My... Lanta! That is called right where you want it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Woohoo! Oh, man. 
Oh, this cat has just crushed it tonight. Wow, the colors on this guy are freaking ridiculous. Damn. <laughs> That's the two-handed deluxe we were looking for right there. What a crazy fish that is. His color patterns are crazy. Thank you so much. You have been nothing but kind, sir. Oh, see ya. <laughs> yes. I know I've said this before, but I will say it again. One run in the Driftless region, just like this, can turn your entire trip around. And not even saying I was having a poor trip because we are doing pretty well. But this, just put it over the top, baby. Over the top. <laughs> Let's stay pinned. I'll get this all cleaned up. There we go. See ya. Thank you. Nice. Hello. Oh, little fella. Not a little fellow. Mr. Man, settle down. We need to get that ant from you. Flies are out of the way. Senor, gracias, adios. That's my bad. That's on me. Oh, you're a really nice fish. And I'm going to know that Nancy you like a damn fool. Like a damn fool. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you there. I definitely got lucky. I was reeling up and he absolutely clobbered this caddis, buddy. Okay. Oh, well, and just like that. And it popped off. Perfect. Well, there goes that. My mind was somewhere else, not on this run. And, uh,. I think it was actually on maybe potentially getting out of here. We are just rounding off at 6.30 and I still have a lot to do tonight, um, non-fishing wise, unfortunately. So yeah, I think I might, uh, I think I might skedaddle. Let's uh, find our way back to the road and see what, uh, see what it looks like. Now I am very much aware that I could have pressed my luck a bit more on this evening session, but this hike out, it can be pretty nasty in the dark and I still had a few things to do on my drive home. So after a much needed creek bath, it was time to come down off the high of this just incredible day. In my experience, there's no better way to do this than watching the sunset. Looking back on the day, it's almost hard to believe that all these events transpired in such a short amount of time. It's so rare to find fishing destinations that allow for such a wide range of angling experiences. From unique native populations of brook trout to potentially trophy level browns, there is no doubt something for everyone here. Add cute towns, beautiful places to stay, and breathtaking scenery, I am always amazed more folks don't find themselves lost in the Driftless. This was set to be a big week. I just didn't quite realize it yet, and truth be told, it started out just like any other. Kelsey and I, we would go on occasional walks around the property to try and break up the monotony of the daily grind, and. In the evenings, I would always make sure to hit the weights or do some trail running to stay in shape for upcoming mountain adventures. But like always, I had work projects with deadlines and the editing grind, it was really starting to pile up. And I would like to blame all these distractions for my mistake because it's just not like me to miss something this big. And looking back, I take full responsibility for this massive oversight. This was set to be the most involved adventure of this driftless trip and I almost dropped the ball. Blake and I, we are planning to tackle the Yellow River. 
It must have been around midweek when I finally started to dig into some general information about this watershed, and it didn't take long for anxious shivers to slide down my spine as I was immediately met with red flags. Diving in a little deeper into the maps themselves, the red flags, they made complete sense. The 13 mile section we were planning on floating was completely bordered by private land. As anglers, we should all be aware that water access laws vary from state to state. For the vast majority of rivers and streams in Iowa, stream beds are considered to be a part of a landowner's private property. Stream beds equals private land. Translation, wading equals trespassing. This was a massive monkey wrench in our plans. The mood of the farmhouse matched the nasty weather that rolled in the next day. It must have been my Missouri route showing, but water access laws in the show me state at least allow for wading if the stream is navigable by boat. I cross-referenced every single Iowa angling book I owned and read through a handful of articles pertaining to this issue. Every author stated that the Yellow River could not in any way, shape, or form be waded without trespassing. Blake and I, we had been talking about this trip for months now, and we'd hyped it up in such a major way. You know how it goes? This was supposed to be the trip. We contemplated alternative plans, and they were all okay, but we didn't want okay. We wanted the Yellow River. Something about this situation just didn't sit right in my head. Call me stubborn or call me skeptical, I just couldn't believe that this was the case. I needed to find out for myself. Bright and early the following day, I started making cold calls to every river coordinator, fisheries biologist, and conservation officer in this corner of Iowa. I was met with a lot of voicemails at first, and a few hours into this wild goose chase, I finally started to get some calls back and slowly but surely, progress was made. One of my biggest leads came when I heard the phrase, incidental use. The state employee I was speaking with sent over an absolute gold mine of information with regards to this particular issue. And that is where this hearing from the Office of the Attorney General comes into play. Essentially, it broke down the various river designations and what is considered incidental use with regards to outdoor recreationalists. This was big, and I have it linked down below if anyone watching would like to go through it themselves. Also, while we're on this subject, don't be afraid to contact state agencies. More often than not, they are happy to help you with whatever you're looking for, and trust me, a 10 minute phone call can make everyone's lives that much easier. But now this little snowball was starting to pick up speed and pick up mass. I received a lot of good information and multiple green lights from individuals in various departments. But what I really needed was a solid confirmation from a conservation officer. And yes, I know, I was asking for permission rather than forgiveness, but I would much rather play it safe than sorry. And as luck would have it, I was still recording when I got the most important call of the day. So what can you tell me about incidental use? Now because I was filming B-roll, I didn't quite realize I was still recording at first when the call initially came in, so I'm gonna mute out everything from this individual I was speaking with. It just didn't seem right to include without him being aware I was filming at the time, but essentially we went back and forth a bit, trying to get a comprehensive understanding of what incidental use meant in the realm of the law. Well, and I guess I should give context. I'm from Missouri, so we're the we're the same way as Wisconsin, where all the stream beds are technically up to a high water mark public land, as long as they are not navigable streams. Right. That's why planning this trip, I'm trying to do my best to get everything correct before I show up, and I just want to avoid any conflicts with be it private landowners or a conservation agent. Um, you know, not doing my due diligence as a rec recreationalist, so. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of calling and asking. So, to just just again to confirm, if I were to put in at a public access point, I can in fact get out of my canoe and wade and fish in the Yellow River as long as I'm not on the bank. I can wade right. as incidental use in the stream bed. Yep. Perfect. He proceeded to tell me all sorts of stories of conflict between landowners and boaters floating down the Yellow River. This again tells me that there's a ton of people using this river throughout the summer, which contradicts everything I read and heard prior to this call. But while he did that, 
I finally realized that I had been recording this entire time. Again, it just didn't feel right to include his part of the conversation, so I hope you believe what I'm saying. Yep, I mean, my plans were not to be, and this kind of sounds wrong, not to be sneaky, but to, to leave no trace. Like, I, I don't have any intentions of, you know, building Shangri-La and swinging a hammock. I'm purely wanting to float and fish this, um, and I have yep. a canoe available, so... Um, the waiting aspect of it was, you know, going through all these, you know, these different um, attorney general jurisdictions and then hearsay from the commercial outfitters and then, you know, different conservation agents like yourself. I think uh, I finally, I finally got the answer um, I was looking for, which is awesome. As the call wrapped up, I made sure to thank him for his time and very valuable information. And he may not have realized it, but he just made two trout bums very, very happy. But now with the weekend right around the corner, we had to scramble to pull the rest of this trip together. It was time for boat prep. In order to properly partake in a float trip, you gotta have something to float on. Luckily for us, a coworker of Blake's had so kindly allowed us to borrow his canoe. So a huge shout out goes to you. If you're watching right now, you know who you are. So thank you so much again. And while I was wildly distracted by clucking chickens and scampering barn kittens, Blake tracked down the mighty vessel high up in the rafters. And it didn't take us long to get it down and strapped in tight. Well, tight enough to make it back to the farm at least. With only hours to spare, we unloaded our newly acquired craft and prepped the rest of our fishing and filming gear for an early morning. It was almost hard to believe, but after frantic research, hours on the phone, and nearly giving up on this adventure, our maiden voyage down the Yellow River was going to happen after all. Engines idled in the crisp morning air. I loaded up the rest of the fishing stuff while Blake tied down the last few straps. Was it strapped down good? Yeah, I'd say so. Was it legal? Well, technically yes. But Iowa can be one windy place, and when you mix that with highway speeds, you're kind of asking for trouble. So before we sped up, Blake pulled over to give it one last final check. I just wanted to check him before we got on highway speed, so. Yep. Sounds good, man. There were a few shifts and bumps along the way, but for the most part, she held steady in the dim morning light. Growing up in Missouri, I've been on my fair share of float trips, but as the sun crept up over the horizon, I can't remember starting a float with such low temps. It was really chilly. I could already feel the cold water numbing my extremities, but there was no turning back now. We dropped off Blake's truck at the takeout point and punched it upstream. Anticipation of the morning bite kept the sense of urgency levels and RPM gravel pops at an all-time high. Pulling into the access point, we had just barely beat the sun to the water, which in my book is always a great start to the day. But there was no time to get hung up on small victories. The easiest part of the day was now done. It was time to load up all our float trip junk into the canoe and overthink whether we packed too much or not enough. All right, Blake, before I put the big cam away, I need first impressions, initial thoughts. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? It's cold. It's going to be a long day. It's going to be a good day. Um, big fish only. Big fish only. That's right. <laughs> okay. One last check. Do you have everything in there? Everything I have. Phone keys, wallet, that, bag, paddle. Well, as long as everything's in there. Nothing. If it's not there, we don't have it. It's gone. <laughs> so... All right, well, this is it, man. Let's make it happen. All right, how do you want to do this? Just angle it? We want to shoot out probably that, right? Yeah, okay. We're down to clean that. All right, you want me in first? Yeah. You can first be really without getting wet. It'll be good, I think. I think so too. Oh, baby. What do you think of that? <laughs> Floating. Holy hell. <laughs> We're here, boys. We're here. We did it. We freaking did it. God, this water was perfect. I know. It felt so good to dig that paddle deep and glide effortlessly through the forbidden waters of the Yellow River. Even though we were here to fish, we didn't stop much after we launched. The air and water temps were still really cold, and we were hoping to get a bit of distance between us and any other potential floaters on the day. 
This time was mostly filled with getting a feel for the weight distribution and drilling at potential honey holes we should have fished. Yeah, this whole riffle section, I feel you could swing a streamer through it and just rip. They just gotta be. And that's where the big ends will stay. Right under that stick. Oh my God. Big ends. With each stroke of the paddle, the confidence in our sea legs went up. So much so that I decided to bust out the big cam yeah, to get some sweet it. shots. Now, at this point, we, mostly me, were riding the line of downright cocky. The yellow wasted no time putting us right back in our place. Um, do you want to try and, uh, how are we going to do this? Talk to me, Goose. We're going to have to punch it through? We're going to have to now. I need to paddle the front. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I got this. Okay, stay there. I'm gonna jump out and push back out to that rock. Okay? Yeah. Oh, okay, we took on quite a bit of water there. That one there, I don't know what it had done. It just kept S curving. And then by the time I saw this, I honestly don't think we could have even made it under that without getting out anyway. Probably not. Incidental. The armchair canoe expert might say we could have handled that better, and in hindsight, I might agree. But in the moment, things happen so quick. Blake and I were extremely lucky we didn't tip right there and then. This right here is a perfect example of where incidental use comes into play. With this down tree, we had to jump out of the canoe and wade. It would have been next to near impossible to get around it any other way. So with any hope of staying somewhat dry and warm now thrown out the window, we hopped back in and took a much more conservative approach to future runs. Oh, this along there looks nice. Pretty deep too. <laughs> Let's <f> go. <laughs> oh, hilarious. It would be. The stalkers, the stalkers. The stalkers, the stalkers. This is why we came. I don't know why, but when you swung on, I was like, oh my god, a big thing. I know, it felt good. It felt really good. And then I saw it jump, I'm like, okay, I don't need to run. Just a little feller. Well, there we go. Skunk off, first fish of the day. See ya. Nice. Oh yeah. Oh, and I don't have that. Oh, hell yeah. Hey, nice. dude. Great fish to start the day. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for, exactly. Right on the, right on the edge of the lake. Chinny chin chin. Great way to start the day. <laughs> what a beautiful fish, man. Hi, Mr. Man. We did it. Skunk off. <laughs> Time to float home. <laughs> Big. Big zone. Those first two fish lifted a massive weight off our shoulders. This whole trip was quite the gamble, and if all else went to hell, we can at least take solace in the fact we at least didn't get skunked. Now that the river was becoming a bit easier to navigate, Blake suggested I pick up the rod and do some fishing from the boat. And so, I did. Well, we did it. Off cam, we did it. First fish on the boat. There we go, on the mini meat whistle. Like, like he's supposed to. What a good fish, thank you. How awesome is that, dude? <laughs> that, that's so cheeky. Well, that little brown kinda gave us false hope because even around mid-morning, we were still floating hard on the struggle bus. 
A big effort was made to stop at what we thought would be productive runs, and my god did we fish them hard. Deep nymph rigs and trash pandas alike were furiously thrown at any fishing looking water, and yet, nothing. This was supposed to be the promised land, full of big sloppy browns and holdover rainbows the size of corn silos, but for whatever reason, the fish need to be sleeping in on this Saturday morning. So after we passed our first bridge for the day, a bit more contemplation was in order. It was time to chill for a bit and stop for a much needed mid-morning beer break. That, because it's the other, it's like, oh, they're gonna be freaking giant over there, or they're gonna be so many over there. And I mean, I don't have to do one thing too. I think we are behind, I think we're missing something. Whether it's a location, whether it's a rig, I just think we've covered enough water and not gotten bit enough in the high product like you know what i'm saying like we've covered enough high quality water that yeah. i think we're missing something something so small they're eating nymphs they're they're chasing streamers yeah like uh -huh. like maybe just keying in more on like where they're at sitting you know what i mean like it's just weird like just those two big runs that we fish thoroughly until we catch one to two out of them a piece one well, little dinkers too as you say i'm like we're missing we're missing something yeah. whether we're speaking them whether we're you know what i mean like i think i think we're still learning with newfound warmth and confidence the day began to shift even if just by a little that was still something it was my turn to wade and fish this run and instead of focusing on the deeper sections i decided to punch it hard into the faster riffle sections and by some miracle, this slight shift in approach yielded two small rainbows back to back. Not exactly what Blake and I were hoping for on this epic float, but it was a step in the right direction and a much needed clue. If you folks at home can't tell, we are riding the struggle boat today. It's uh, few and far between, but we're kind of tweaking something as the sun's gotten up. But there goes the second rainbow. He gone. Let's keep moving. Not but a few bends down, this new approach was validated yet again with a canoe fish drifted through some choppy water just before it dumped into a deep eddy. That dimey dime swam back and we figured he must have some friends, so we hopped out and fished the deeper portions. Blake fished it hard and the drifts looked so juicy. Knee deep in the mud, I watched my brother in arms serve up some of the cleanest drifts this side of the upper Iowa. That hopper, it slid over the surface with not so much as a wiggle. At this point, it was almost insulting how beautiful the approach was, and yet, no fish. The only thing that was biting consistently were the hunger pangs of an early morning fueled solely on bush light and cold toes. It was rounding off right around 11, and this bejaggled boat crew needed a major pick-me-up. Luckily, we had the perfect river lunch waiting for us, cooled down in the cold. This right here is a huge shout out to my mom because she would always pack chicken tendies on the river. Cold chicken tendies are like nothing else. It is the ultimate game changer. And today I'm changing Blake's mind about the cold chicken tendy. Because we need to pick me up. <laughs> in a major way. Can you pick me up? <laughs> There's not much in this world stronger than the power of nostalgia. Cold chicken tendies and watermelon transports me right back to some warm sandbar somewhere on the Merrimack River with my parents, Big sis and dog soaking in the magic of the Ozarks on a Missouri summer day. Now, of course, the supporting characters in a river lunch like oatmeal cream pie, cold beer, and goldfish crackers help elevate the overall experience, but you just can't beat ice cold quick trip tendies dunked in that honey musty. Truly a culinary experience. Stepping back into the canoe, the sun and spirits were much higher. And at this point, Blake and I started to finally find our groove. We had gotten much better at reading the water in advance and making the most out of the runs as we floated by. I mean, who, who knows how many fish could be in there? Do you want to bank it? <laughs> that, whatever that was. Hold us here, Captain. No, no, no. Give it time. Give it time. There it is. Oh. <laughs> Not... <laughs> I'll take it, man. Not a bad fish, though. Yeah. 
No, don't sit on my lap, buddy. We gotta go. You gotta go. Oh, there we go. Oh, graceful. With each and every fish caught, we were slowly putting the puzzle pieces together. Each spunky chub or little brown would be another data point needed to build up how and where these fish were eating. Changing up flies and focusing much more on the faster water seemed to be the ticket. That is something. Am I good? There we go. That's something. Well, there we go. That's a beautiful little brown. Today certainly hasn't been easy. Definitely not what we expected. Um, I think Blake and I kind of had every assumption we were going to come in here and whoop them. But so far it's been few and far between. We've kind of been prospecting. So Blake has been very generous and kind of leading me on the way as I'm casting forward prospecting. And so like this, we just caught a fish out of this run as we're floating through. So now we might stop and actually try and pick this apart a little bit more efficiently rather than just floating over it. And so. that is exactly what Blake did. Oh my gosh. That's a good fish, Blake, that's a good fish. That's a better fish, man. <laughs> yes, hey! dude, let's freaking go. What the heck? <laughs> oh, it's a much better fish. Gorgeous brown. Oh yeah, that adipose is fired in there. Nice. Good stuff. <laughs> Holy cow, dude. How good does that feel? I mean, it's not even, I mean, it's, we're freaking out, but like, it's, that feels like really good. <laughs> Great fish, man. Fantastic. Oh, oh, he says, I'm going, he I'm said out. That. He got the bird. Go. With that nice brown back in the drink, the action of our day reached its boiling point. You knocked me down, swept my feet off the ground, left me on the floor. Hard to resist, got me looking like this, like the one before. Cause I must be strong. Cause this might go on for long. Cause I was wrong. This trip brings a whole new meaning to keep your feet in the water. Yeah, no shit. Right? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yes, dude, let's freaking go. I think we figured it out. To say we've been struggling would be kind of uh, a privileged attitude, let's just say, because uh, we've been doing well. We've been catching fish here and there on the boat and at you know, certain spots that we stop at, but it's not normal for Blake and I. And we've been kind of scratching our brains this entire time wondering what the heck, what are we not doing? And something that we noticed is that the water is warmer than most trout rivers that we have usually been on, like for you Missouri folks, the current river or out west, some of those bigger rivers. They're cold, almost like they hurt when you step in them. So what we've been trying to key in on is riffle sections, where the water is moving, where it's shallow and where it's fast, where the oxygen is high and the water is cold. That seems to be where the fish are sitting. And so 
we've adjusted our rigs. Second half of the day, especially after lunch, we've really kind of keyed them in. And this, this is probably my nicest fish of the day. That's a shouldered up brown trout straight from the Yellow River and it's dandy, I tell you what. But yeah, it's been a blast trying to figure them out. One, uh, one dimey dime at a time and I think, well, it's time to let him back. See you, buddy. It's a decent, it's a decent fish. Well, filming is nothing short of impossible on this canoe. I've got the best captain this side of the Mississippi. Everyone give Blake a big special shout out for towing my ass around. <laughs> but we're trying our best to film the floating section. We're actually finding a lot more, especially in these straighter sections, which is nice. But yeah, I guess we need to keep going down the reel. Now, I guess any of you out there watching, you're just gonna have to take my word for it, but I asked Blake on several occasions to switch spots with me so that he could do some fishing in the front of the boat. With each and every advance, he kindly declined and said that he actually enjoyed steering and positioning the boat. And hell, he was doing such a damn good job, it was hard to argue with the man. So I kept hammering the fish as best as I could while we were rounding the corner on the final few miles of this float. Well, that's a fish. Ugh, nice. We got it. How's it going? Doing really well. Yeah. Good luck to you. And they're definitely eager to eat when presented correctly. But they all seem to be very similar size. You're gonna say, I don't know what. I mean, this has been the slot. <laughs> A lot of them, but yeah, this has definitely been the slot. Something worth mentioning that we noticed throughout the day was that a lot of these browns and rainbows were right around the same size. I'm unsure of the natural reproduction rates in bigger systems like this, but I do remember reading somewhere that the Iowa DNR throws in thousands of fingerling trout into the yellow every single year. This would make sense as to why there were so many catchable fish around the same size. Now, I'm not a biologist, but if I had to guess, a lot of these fish we found were right around that two to three year size range. Definitely not the monsters we expected to find, but after getting to see so many miles of this river, I still firmly believe that this water can produce some absolute behemoth trout. Hello. Bye. Hey, Bingo. sir. Let's go. Look at my fish. Let's go. Hey, y'all. Very nice. So as that sun started its downward trajectory over the hills, we shifted our focus from fishing to paddling. With each bridge we passed, we could kind of get a gauge on how many miles we had left. And I will be the first to admit that we bit off significantly more than what we could chew. Daylight was now a hot commodity and Blake and I had to punch it into absolute overdrive if we wanted to get off the river before dark. But with how beautiful each bend was, it was hard to even begin to complain. The pace of this kind of fishing allows you to see so much in such a short period of time. Well, relatively. We had the absolute privilege of observing this river change in a significant way the closer it meandered to the big river. This great unknown was now a bit more familiar in our minds and the memory was now forever captured on film. As we pulled in to the final bridge with our takeout point, Blake and I let out a great exhale knowing that we had done it. 
This would no doubt be the first of many floats on this incredible trout river. And after many months of speculating, we had finally fished and floated the mighty yellow. Well, this was my last week here in the Driftless, and Blake and I both agreed that before I left, we need to run back an absolute classic. We rolled into the Bloody Run parking lot on a sultry Iowa evening and immediately started sweating our butts off. The skeleton frames of the old railroad bridges cut through the deep green foliage, and their weathered red beam seemed to match up with my memory. But for some reason, the fishing did not. I've never fished it this late in December before, but the water seemed a lot slower and so full of algae. Now I will say, this thought didn't really register at first because Blake managed to pull up to the first hole of the day and within a few minutes hooked into a dandy bloody run brown. Well there it is. Hey. Is that our first BRB? Yes, indeed it is. Let's go, dude. That was right where you should have been. Great fish. Way to start that day, baby. Let's get him back before I drop him. Yeah. He, he got a big head on him. Hell yeah, dude. Let's yes, go. let's go. We both figured this was a good sign. First run, first fish. Maybe this was the bloody of old. But unfortunately, we ended up doing a lot of walking. And I mean a lot. The walk to fish ratio was at a great imbalance, which had Blake and I very confused. Now, I doggedly punched my rig into a deep fast run, and I did hook into a bloody run brown. Now, this gun goes off, but for this section of bloody, it was not the play, and we were running out of time. This wasn't an easy decision to make because we had already invested so much time here, but we both agreed that we needed to bail. And since we were in the neighborhood, the best course of action would be to ask our old friend, Sny McGill, if she had a bit of extra sugar she could lend us. And as luck would have it, there just so happened to be a bit of extra brown sugar swimming around. We only found one productive hole in a place as pressured as Sny, especially during the stocking season. You know, that was a win for us on an already rough evening. But walking back to the truck, Blake and I both agreed that this could not be our last session here in the Driftless. So the next night, we saddled up for another evening session a bit closer to the farm this time. With a few options to pick from, we settled on a creek that we had hit earlier on this Driftless trip. She had been mighty kind to us back then, and we were hoping for similar results. Being the only ones in the parking lot set our minds at ease and allowed us to take our time rigging up. Much like the first time, the hike in wasn't bad at all, and once we got down to the creek itself, it didn't take me very long to break the skunk with a few freshly stocked rainbows. Had one go off on the dry, which was pretty cool, but a deep nymph rig was the real winner here. When I know that I'm fishing a heavily stocked stream, I generally like to fish with bigger and brighter patterns. My guess is that these raceway heroes have never really seen a big bright red copper john, and they sure took it like they were interested to see how it tasted. Jumping up just one run, Blake managed to break the skunk in a similar fashion with a spunky little stalker boy that flopped out of his net before we could get a good look at him it was already clear that we had made the right choice in deciding to come to this stream. The further upstream we moved, away from the easy access, we found ourselves in the middle of a brown trout bonanza. We were both unsure if these browns were stocked or wild, and it's always hard to tell because sometimes the DNR will throw fingerling fish in a lot of the streams in this part of Iowa. With fins intact and vibrant colors, this gives them the appearance and tendencies of wild fish. You know that there's one sitting in that root wob. Yeah, I know. I just did it. Oh. Well, that's the brown we want. Sitting where it should be. That's a solid fish. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So why can't mine do that? <laughs> My small ones. I'm whispering sweet nothings into their ear. Ready to see him back? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> Just grab him there. Yep. Very nice. Be it wild or stocked, it really doesn't matter to me in this situation. They're munching down good and putting up one hell of a fight. And 
It also doesn't hurt how each one is just so gorgeous. I was gonna say, my god. Looks pretty good in there. Oh. Yeah, trout are super Wow, he's chunky boy. That's a cheeky copper J muncher. As we got closer to the next decent access point, the stream density of stocked rainbows got a lot higher. We both managed to clean up a few more just before the takeout point. That's it. You got the copper jay in his face? Ah! Ooh. Copper jay's not in his face anymore. It's in my hand. Yeah, there you go. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. I don't know what to do with my hands. He gone. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. It's a little sad to think that this was going to be my last time fishing with Blake for probably a long time. But... Looking back on all we had done in this brief month, I mean, it's hard to argue. We crushed it, and I'm already excited to see where our next adventures are gonna land us. With only days left, I had time for one more quick evening session up in Minnesota. I linked back up with my buddy Becker, and we excitedly hustled upstream. Now, looking back, I should have known better, but not wearing thicker pants was a major mistake on my part. The neck high riprap was difficult enough to navigate, so it didn't help that this entire hike, I was getting absolutely pummeled by blankets of sting nettle. For those of you folks unfamiliar with the Midwest, there are a lot of plants that just kind of hate you. Some that come to mind would be things like poison ivy or wild parsnip, but tonight it was all about the sting nettle. Getting to the water was the best way to quell the itchy burn of that evil plant and once we jumped in, we both noticed that this was one buggy creek. Big caddis and mayflies were under almost every single rock and the most shocking thing was as we walked upstream, we saw so many crayfish or crawdads. That seemed to me to be more indicative of a warm water stream, but at the time, I really didn't pay it much attention. Only after fishing the first few runs really hard, did Becker and I start to scratch our heads. We were putting down some good drifts where the fish should have been, but we were not getting so much as a look. Now, I did manage to get one little fella to bite my hopper, and when I got that brown to my hand, I noticed that the fish itself felt very warm. Letting it go, Becker and I both agreed that this main stem of the river, it had probably warmed up considerably and the fish, they were no longer here or not at least in their same densities. With the shadows growing longer by the minute, we need to make a decision and make one quick. We were at that pivotal moment of whether or not we should stay or go. And in the end, we decided to fight the stinging nettle once again and try to run downstream to a feeder creek. The idea is that this smaller body of water would be significantly cooler than the main stem. Now I don't want to say that we were in any sort of a rush, but we certainly had our hustle on because we were losing light really quick. Within the first few bends walking up this tiny feeder, it was clear we had at least made the right decision. We could see darts and flashes of brown and silver and it seemed like there were some really big ones too. Now, getting the fish to eat was no easy task in this small stream. Casting lanes are super tight, and you have to have pinpoint accuracy if you want to have any chance of hooking into a fish. There's that little plant coming in the water to the top right. Oh, nice. I think it's just going to be a little brown. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just a little brown. Whatever it should be. Well, he was too small for the net. He just zipped off. Dude, that's a nice fish. <laughs> Mike picked out the old nice Annie's ant. <laughs> it's a winner. Wow, he oh. is he's super dark. There you go. See you, buddy. Dude, that's what there I'm talking is. about. Oh, I knew that, Kathy. <laughs> Yo, he, he munched it down. Dude. Where are you going with that, sir? Alright. See you buddy. Thank you. There we go. The silver lining behind this more advanced style of fishing is that any fish, no matter how small, feels so satisfying. 
even though we only managed to get a couple little fish, it still broke the skunk. And I mean, how can you beat a driftless evening like this? It was absolutely gorgeous. This last adventure was meant to be a bit more than what it ended up being, but if there's one thing my family knows how to do, we sure can make lemonade out of lemons. This was meant to be a mother-son fishing trip, but the weather had different plans. So instead of focusing solely on the fishing, I took my folks to some of my favorite places in the area and told them stories of all the great adventures their vagabond son was having. As luck would have it, the rain unexpectedly cleared up in the afternoon and we ended up going out on the stream after all. The hike in was absolutely gorgeous and I was so happy to be able to finally explain to them the unique features of this part of the world as they had their boots on the ground. When we finally got down to the stream, my mom was a bit apprehensive at first and I don't blame her. She doesn't consider herself much of a fly angler, but she sure made it look easy. Standing up on that log, she had a great vantage point and a perfect casting lane above. This deep hole was absolutely loaded with creek chub and wild brown trout alike. She had managed to shake off that skunk and in my book, that was mission accomplished. But then she put on an absolute clinic. That's my bigger fish. Yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Nice fish. Uh. Ah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, okay, fish. now that's a beaut. That's All right, a let's one. let's get you down here. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. All oh, right, sweetie. I want to get some looks at this guy. Yeah, this fish. could be my best one for that's the day. That's your driftless fish right there. Yeah, baby. Peace. <laughs> now that's a fish right there. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I got busy now. Things were going so well that my dad even decided to pick up a rod and managed to catch a wild brown for himself. Tell you what, um, took the dry fly. I'm gonna just toss it in the direction. I'm not gonna try and catch you or hit you. No way. Some part of me wishes the weather would have cooperated better and we could have stuck with the original plan. But I think that this last trip with my parents ended up being the perfect cherry on top of an incredible month here in the Driftless region. Well, if you were seeing this, and that means this week of Driftless Adventures is officially over and all I have to say, as always folks, is thank you so much for sticking around and watching these videos all the way to the end. I don't quite get the YouTube algorithm, but it certainly helps and I appreciate you guys kind of sticking around for a different style of video. I'm trying to capture all this driftless, all this uh, magic, let's just say, the life side and the fishing side and putting it into these kind of, uh, yeah, little isolated episodes. So I do appreciate it and, you know, be it the YouTube, the Instagram, website, Discord, this file season community it's growing like a damn weed and i have you guys to thank for that so keep being awesome out there i appreciate it and love talking to you so yeah hit me up if you ever have any questions and folks wherever you find yourself be it in beautiful driftless scenery like this or in your backyard i sure hope you're keeping those feet in the water and until next time tight lines <laughs>